from the Open University, and uh, she's going to speak about uh, boundary dynamics on wandering domains. So, okay, good. Now sharing has worked and... Uh, can you see it? Yeah, right? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Nuria. Um, I should start by saying a, th a big thank you to all the organizers. Well, it would be great to be in Barcelona, but given the circumstances, it's fantastic that we can all meet online. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about work in progress, which is joined with uh, Anna Miriam Benini, Nuria, uh, Phil and Gwyneth, who spoke earlier. Um, and this is work on boundary dynamics of simply connected wandering domains. So, okay. So I will start with a short introduction. Um, since most people are familiar with um, the basics on uh, transcendental entire functions and iteration. Um, then I'll give our first result, which um, will hopefully motivate um, the rest of our results. Uh, uh, since, it, um, uh, since there are some uh, questions that arise naturally from our first result. Um, so um, after the first result, I will um, uh, speak about some questions that are related to it, and then hopefully try to go through the questions for the remaining of the talk, and give some further results and examples, and uh, link our work to uh, inner functions, which was also part of our motivation. Uh, so Gwyneth gave um, an introduction to um, like the Fatou and the Julia set. I'm going to start with um, uh, defining uh, wandering domains. So throughout the talk, F will be a transcendental entire function. Um, and um, a Fatou component of F, U, uh, is called a wandering domain. If uh, any two forward images of U um, are disjoint. So these are two components that are not eventually periodic. And um, for example, it could be a case where one wandering domain maps to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and uh, go to infinity. Uh, but we'll speak about the, uh, the th three different types of wandering domains in terms of um, uh, tending to infinity. Um, just to say here that uh, rational functions have no wandering domains, as Sullivan uh, saw in 1984, um, which was a um, like, uh, breakthrough result. And this is also true for some classes of transcendental entire functions, but it's not true in general. The first example of a transcendental entire function, which has a wandering domain, uh, was given by Baker. And actually, his example, I think Gwyneth also mentioned that example, his example was a multiply connected wandering domain, whereas today we focus on simply connected wandering domains. Um, so now, in terms of um, converging to the boundary, to the, sorry, converging to infinity, we can um, classify our wandering domains into three types. So we say that the wandering domain is escaping. Um, I think this was also mentioned in Gwyneth's talk. Uh, so a wandering domain is escaping if uh, the orbits of all points in the wandering domain tend to infinity. We say that the wandering domain is oscillating if every point in the wandering domain has a subsequence of its orbit that stays bounded and a subsequence tending to infinity. And the third case is uh, where uh, the orbits of all points stay bounded. We say that our wandering domain is of bounded orbit type. And actually, all the known examples. Uh, of wandering domains are of oscillating or escaping type. And it is one of the biggest questions in the area whether actually wandering domains of bounded orbit type exist or not. Right, um, so let me um, start by um, saying that um, the uh, Bergweiler, Ripon, and Stallard gave a um, detailed description of uh, the dynamics in multiply connected wandering domains. Um, and um, recently, like a couple of years ago, we started studying uh, the internal dynamics of simply connected wandering domains, again, joint work with the same colleagues. And we ended up with a um, nine way classification of simply connected wandering domains. So we classified simply connected wandering domains uh, in two different ways in terms of um, 
hyperbolic distances between orbits of points and in terms of co converging to the boundary or not. So this gave, um, this gave us um, nine uh, types of uh, simply connected wandering domains, which will actually show that they are all realizable. Now, after studying the internal dynamics of simply connected dom uh, wandering domains, our well, natural ne next step was to look at the boundary dynamics of such domains. So in this talk, I will speak about work in progress on um, boundary dynamics of simply connected wandering domains. And in particular, um, we will look at convergence of boundary orbits and the relation to um, internal orbits converging to the boundary or to a specific boundary orbit, orbit precisely. Um, and I'm going to start by giving you uh, our first result, which relates these two things. So um, if we have a transcendental entire function f and we take a sequence of bounded simply connected wandering domains, and we have a boundary point uh, of u naught, so uh, uh, zeta naught is on the boundary of u naught, uh, and let zeta n denote this, uh, the orbit of zeta naught. Then we define the set B naught, which is a subset of the boundary of the wandering domain U naught. And it's exactly that set on the boundary, which consists of the boundary points whose orbit tends to zeta n. So we define our set, <clears throat> our set B naught, and our result says that. If we assume that B0 has positive harmonic measure with respect to U0, then for all points in the wandering domain U0, so for all points Z in U0, we have that their orbits converge actually to the same orbit Zn. So what does this theorem tell us in other words? Um, so we relate the boundary behavior to the behavior in, in the interior of the wandering domain in the following way. We assume, if we assume that we have a set on the boundary of U0, where all points tend to, uh, to, um, to the boundary orbit zeta n, if that set has positive measure, then we can show that all points in the interior of the wandering domain have the same behavior, meaning that their orbits converge to the same boundary orbit, the zeta n. Just to say here, in relation to what I was um, describing earlier about the classification of simply connected wandering domains, that uh, a wandering domain where, um, uh, inter where internal orbits of interior points converge to the boundary is called uh, of converging type. So this is one of the three types of wandering domains that can occur in terms of converging to the boundary or not. So whenever points in the interior have orbits converging to the boundary, this is a converging type uh, wandering domain. Um, so right, um, so I will now try to uh, give the idea of the perf of theorem one, which is based actually uh, on, um, on an argument of Phil and Winnett. Um, so if we, if we uh, consider um, U and Z to be the, logali the logarithm of uh, the diameter of U n, over the modulus f and z minus zeta n. And we define this in the closure of our wandering domain u naught, uh, taking it equal, equal to infinity uh, whenever f n of z is equal to zeta n. Uh, then this is a positive and harmonic function on u, in u naught. And it is uh, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to infinity on the boundary of u naught. So what we actually do here is we use this harmonic uh, function in order, um, uh, in order to uh, be able to apply an argument uh, uh, used by Ripon and Stallard in the uh, paper of uh, boundaries of escaping for two components on UN. So what we do is um, we, uh, we have that UN is a positive harmonic function in U0, and it is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to infinity on the boundary of U0. And then we also have that it tends to infinity uh, on, on the set B0. Remember our set B0 is the one from the statement of our theorem. And if we use this, then following the same argument uh, as they had, 
we can deduce that actually un of z tends to infinity for all points in the wandering domain. Now, what this gives us is that we have a unz, which is defined in the, can you see my, uh, my mouse? Uh, okay. Um, so uh, we have unz, which is defined in this way, tending to infinity for all points in the wandering domain, which means that fn of z tends to zn n as our theorem is this as our theorem um said fn of z tends to zn for all points in the interior of our wandering domain um i actually started with this theorem because um as i said this theorem can be uh, there are some natural questions that arise from this theorem and um let um let us see um, what somebody could ask looking at theorem one. So one natural question is, okay, we say that we have this set on the boundary B naught, which is of positive harmonic measure and has this property that the points in B naught have orbits converted to zeta n. So is this a boundary behavior that occur almost everywhere? Can we say something about that? Um, another natural question is, does the converse of theorem one hold? <clears throat> what do we mean when we say converse? We mean that if we have a convergence of interior points, or, so if the orbits of interior points converge to a boundary orbit, can we deduce something about boundary orbits too, in terms of converging to that the same orbit or not? And, and the third question is, are there always such Danzois wolf orbits? Now, when I say, I'm going to give a definition later, when I say Danzois wolf orbit, you should understand it as, as an analog of a Danzois wolf point in the iteration case. So um, it's, a, it's a, an orbit on the boundary such that uh, uh, points in, in our wandering domain tend to that uh, boundary orbit and the iteration. So had, uh, they have orbits tending to that uh, boundary orbit. Um, so, in the remaining of the talk, I'll try to go through, through these three questions and see what kind of results we have towards these questions and how we relate that to the case uh, of um, inner functions and what is known about uh, iterates of inner functions in analogous, um, in, in analogous uh, questions. Um, first, our first question, our first question was, if the boundary behavior occurs almost everywhere. Now about that, we have the following theorem. So if we have exactly the same hypothesis, we have the theorem A. So what does this mean? We have our F, we have a sequence of um, simply connected wandering domains, and we have our set B naught, which is a subset of the boundary of U naught. Right, so we have this subset of the boundary of U naught, which consists of points of boundary points whose orbits tend to zeta n. And in theorem uh, theorem A, this is not A is one. <laughs> so in theorem one, we assume that B naught has positive harmonic measure. Okay, so we assume all these things now, and we add an extra hypothesis here. So if furthermore there exists, um, well, this, this condition here, that there exists two points in our wandering domain, such that the hyperbolic distance between their orbits tends to zero. This is exactly the same as saying that our wandering domain is contracting. Now, what I mean contracting, let's pause for a minute here and go back to what I said um, was a classification of simply connected uh, wandering domains into different ways. So we classified simply connected wandering domains in terms of uh, hyperbolic distances of orbits of points into three different uh, types, one of them being a contracting wandering domain, which is precisely the case where the, uh, the hyperbolic distance between the orbits of any two points in U naught tend to zero. So here we add this extra hypothesis that our wandering domain is contracting. So we have the hypothesis of theorem one and we also have that U naught is contracting, and we deduce that B naught has full harmonic measure with respect to U naught. Now, question one was, if the boundary behavior occurs almost everywhere, occurs almost everywhere. So 
what we do here is that we say, okay, if we have the setup of theorem one, and on top of that, we assume that our wandering domain is contracting, then we can say actually that, uh, yes, it's true that almost all points on the boundary of U0 have the, the same behavior, which means that they have orbits converging to Zn. And now, um, before moving to, I, I, want, I want to sketch the proof of theorem two, but before doing that, uh, let's uh, take a break from uh, wandering domains and say a couple of things about linear functions uh, because we will use them in the proof of theorem two. So um, holomorphic self-map of the unit disk for which radial limits exist at almost all points of the unit circle and they have modulus one is called an inner function. And actually for inner functions, as for holomorphic self-maps of the unit disk, um, for the iteration of inner functions, we have that there exists, uh, that does one with point, there exists a point in the closure of the unit disk, such that the iterates converge to this point locally uniformly, right? So we have um, a complete understanding of what's happening in that case, in terms of uh, convergence to the Danzois Wolf point. Um, now, what is the relation between this and what we want to achieve here, which is proving theorem two, right? Um, so the middle step here is to, um, to see that we can relate inner functions to simply connected wandering domains uh, via Riemann maps. So, um, if we uh, if we have our like we have a, our sequence of simply connected wandering domains U n U not U one U two and so on, um, then we can uh, by considering Riemann maps from the unit disk to U n, and um, we have down here um, a composition of inner functions. So uh, I, I will I will often be referring to that as a sequence of inner functions as opposed to iterates of the same uh, inner function. Um, but I'll make sure I remind you what it is. Um, so here we have Zn, capital Zn, which is the composition of little Zn up to G1 uh, to be an inner function associated to the restriction of the it nth iterate of F to the wandering domain U0. Uh, why, why, why do we really need this? Um, it's because uh, the key point for the proof of theorem two here is to, okay, we have our setup is in, the one day, in, in, in a sequence of wandering domains. So we want to be able, uh, our key result here is a result that happens for sequences of inner functions. So we, we need, we need to uh, be able to transfer to the unit disks and to associate our uh, situation to a, um, to a composition of linear functions from the unit disk to the unit disk to be able to uh, prove theorem uh, two. Um, I think it will become more apparent when I continue um, through the proof of theorem two. Um, as, as I said, the key result for the proof of theorem two um, is a result about sequence of inner functions. And this is a result by Pomerenke. And um, so I, I want to say a few things about this first. Um, so we have a sequence of inner functions, Fn. And pay attention here, we have this assumption that for, uh, for Z in the unit disk, we need this to be true. And what is this is precisely that the hyperbolic distance between uh, the orb uh, between um, fn of z and fn of zero tends to uh, zero. And why why do I make this point here? Is that okay? I said that we 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 plan to use Pomeranian's theorem to prove theorem too. And if you remember, let, let us go back. Actually, theorem two had the same uh, assumptions as theorem one. But on top of that, we required that our wandering domain is contracting. So has this property on the hyperbolic distance. And this is precisely because we are going to apply Pomerenko's theorem and we want to have um, the hyperbolic distance extending to zero. Okay, let me go back. And um, so the way we are going to use this theorem is 
that whenever here, whenever fn minus one of e is equal to a, a set B for all n, which is going to be our case, this theorem can be used to deduce that uh, the set B has either zero or full harmonic or full um, or has zero or uh, two pi measure. Uh, so this is the way we are going to use it. But in order to be able to use it, we need, as I said, to transfer our setup to uh, the setup of the um, of inner functions and the unit disk. Um, right. So we start we start in our sequence of uh, wandering domains U n. And what we do here? Okay, we have our sequence uh, z zn on the boundary. We have an arbitrary sequence also z naught z one z n in U n. So these are our wandering domains here. And we uh, take Hn to be a univalent function from Un to U0, which sends Z10 to Z0 and Z n to Z0. And then with the help of uh, Hn, we define capital Fn to be Hn of F to the n. So capital Fn is a self map of U0. Actually, all the work we are going to do is going to be done in U0 and associated to the unit disk, right? So we have the self map Fn of U0 here, uh, which sends Z0 to Z0 and Z0 to Z0. And um, let me say, um, I should have said that before I, I looked at the, uh, we looked at the figure, that <clears throat> we can assume that actually our set B0 uh, consists of accessible points. Uh, from U0. And this is because almost all points are accessible. So uh, if need be, we could have made it as, uh, slightly smaller. So we can assume from now on that B0 consists of accessible points from U0. So we do all this, uh, we do, uh, we have this um, picture here now with the wandering domains. And we are going to define a sequence of sets, Bn. So remember, we started with our original set B0, which was a subset of U0 that consists of the points whose, orbit, whose orbits tend, tend to Zn, right? So we had our original set B0, which has positive harmonic measure. And now we define a sequence of sets Bn, and we define it in, in, in this way. So we take um, Bn to be the set on the boundary of Un, Right, boundary points in UN, and um, which are accessible from UN, and also they satisfy that um, the mth iterate of uh, zeta uh, tends to zeta n plus m, where zeta n plus m is understood in the way that zeta n is uh, the forward image of zeta naught, right? So, um, so we define Bn in this way, and here if we put um, if we take m to be equal to zero, this coincides. If uh, sorry, if we take n to be equal to zero, <laughs> this coincides with uh, b naught. So we have b naught and our sequence b n subsets of um, the boundaries of u n, and now we define the sets b n hat, which are defined using our map h n. So b n hat is h n of b n. What does this mean is that all the BN hats, contrary to the BNs, uh, belong to the boundary of U0. So now we are on the boundary of U0 and we have our sets BN hat and our B0, which was always there, which are the forward images of BN under HN. And it is not difficult to show that if we define this this way, then we can take that B0 is actually fn minus one of b n hat. So we are going to use this later. Um, so this is important for us here. Um, as I said, we have now we have now moved um, to uh, u naught, and the, we focus on the boundary of u naught, and we have uh, our set b naught. All the sets b n hat belonging to the boundary of u naught. Now is the crucial step where we go from U0 to the unit disk. 
how do we do that? If you remember a few slides earlier, we saw that <coughs> we can use a Riemann map. So we, we use a Riemann map phi here, phi. And, and we use the Riemann map and the Riemann map, <coughs> uh, what we have is that points on the unit circle uh, whose radial limits exist uh, uh, are associated to accessible points on the boundary of U0. So we can then <coughs> use phi to consider the sets. Now on the boundary of the unit circle, right? So we have our sets on the boundary of U0 and uh, e, uh, E0 uh, is phi minus one of B0 and En is phi, phi minus one of B and hat for N greater than or equal to one. And uh, using Fn, our map, uh, our map Fn here, which was a self map of U0, uh, we define capital Gn to be phi minus one of Fn of phi, right? So this is a self map of the unit disk. And what we are aiming to do here, you probably have already uh, <laughs> seen it yourselves, is that we're aiming to use Pomeranges theorem for this new setup in the unit disk, in the unit circle. So we had assumed uh, that U0 is contracting, which we can then use in order to show that Zn is contracting with respect to the hyperbolic metric as a map. And um, this, this is precisely needed because Zn is the map we are going to use when we apply Pomeranke's theorem. And we want that map to have this property, if you remember. And um, before we do that, we can also, uh, it's not difficult to see that actually E0 is Dn minus one of En, right? So this is because B0 was Fn minus one of Bn hat. Uh, so, uh, and Dn is related to Fn in this way. So E0 is Dn minus one of En. And now we have, um, our map being Gn, capital Gn, and our sets uh, being En on the, units, uh, on the unit circle, right? And we have our map Gn also being contracting. So now let us pause here for a second and we go back and we are going to apply this theorem for to Gn, uh, to the pair Gn and En, and we will deduce um, that this uh, tends to zero here, this quantity tends to zero. Now, if you remember what I said earlier is that in the case that uh, Gn minus one of En is equal to a set B for all N, which is our case here because Gn, of min uh, Gn minus one of En is equal to E naught for all N. So this actually can then be used to, um, to give us that E naught has either uh, me measure zero or measure two pi. Um, since it cannot have measure zero, it has measure two pi. And so we can deduce that E naught has full harmonic measure with respect to D, which we, uh, we can then transfer to uh, back to B naught, which will then have full harmonic measure with respect to U naught. What have we achieved now? We, we wanted to show that whenever we have this setup and our wandering domain is also contracting, then the set B0 has full harmonic measure with respect to U0. And this is, this, is what we, uh, this is what we proved here. And this result, what it actually tells us is that almost all points with respect to harmonic measure on the boundary for wandering domain U0 have orbits which converge to the orbit Zn. So B0, again, one more time, B0 was defined in this way. We assumed that it had positive harmonic measure and that our um, wandering domain was contracting. And we saw that actually this holds for almost all points on the boundary. So this was question, question one. Um, this was question one. And we can now move uh, to question two. But in order to do that, we will first speak about uh, we will first go back and speak about inner functions again. Right. 
So um, what is true? Let's start with the simplest case, right? So what is true for iterates of inner functions on the boundary? Um, actually, there is, um, there is a famous result by Arison that was also proved uh, in a very nice paper by Dering and Magnet on dynamics of inner functions, um, which gives us a complete dichotomy on the boundary behavior of, uh, for iterates of inner functions. So let's recall here that we had already seen the danzois wolf uh, theorem, which, <coughs> which uh, um, uh, gives us um, a detailed description of um, the behavior in the interior of D. And here, um, what we have is a complete dichotomy on the boundary behavior in the sense that if this sum is convergent or as we also know it, is the Blasky condition holds, then the danzois wolf point belongs to the boundary and almost all boundary points have orbits converging to it. Okay, so this is the, the nice case. So whenever the Blasky condition holds, we have that uh, the danzois wolf point belongs to the boundary and almost all boundary points have orbits converging to the danzois wolf point. So, sorry, sorry, Vasso, I think yes. you said it and, and I probably missed it. Um, but um, so when you talk about the orbits of the points on the boundary, so you just- If, if the map is not continuous, this must be understood in the sense of non-tangential limits. Thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thanks, Vasso. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so this was the, the Knight's case. And um, in the case where the sum is divergent, uh, we say that the boundary map, again, um, as Lasse said, uh, the boundary map, we mean in the terms of non-transition limits that exist almost everywhere, is recurrent. And we are particularly interested in an implication of this, which is that whenever the danzois wolf point is on the boundary, then the set of boundary orbits converging to this under iteration has measure zero. Okay, so here we have, um, we have the case where almost all uh, or, uh, boundary points compared to uh, the danzois wolf point under iteration, or we have the case where the danzois wolf point is again on the boundary, but almost no point has an orbit converging there. Um, okay, this of course, uh, to relate that, to what we said um, we, we were interested in as a, as a converse of uh, theorem one. Theorem one was assuming that we have um, a set of positive um, measure on the uh, uh, positive harmonic measure on the boundary um, uh, whose uh, points converge to zeta n under, uh, <coughs> under the iteration of f. And we deduced in theorem one, if you remember, we deduced that all points in the wandering domain tend to that orbit zeta n under iteration. Now, okay, here, of course, this is a different setup. We have inner functions and iteration of inner functions, but we see that in the second case, if we have a double point on the, on the boundary, then points in the interior of D converge there, but almost no boundary point has an orbit converging to the Danzois wolf point. Um, so um, what can we say as um, in analogy to this uh, theorem um, for wandering domains? So um, we, have, um, we have a step um, towards an analog, which is actually uh, the analog of, the of part A of this theorem. So <clears throat> let's go back to our wandering domain setup. And uh, we have again our f and our, uh, un to be our sequence of bounded simply connected one in domains. And we suppose <clears throat> this is our analog of the Blasky condition here. Um, we suppose that there exists a z in the boundary in the, in the one in domain, uh, such that the, the sum of the distance of fn of ZN, uh, zn from the boundary of un to the power half is, uh, is finite then we can deduce that 
almost all boundary orbit or almost all boundary points have an orbit converging to the orbit of Z naught. Now, okay, before we move um, forward, I have to say a few things about this theorem. Uh, first, uh, this theorem was proved this term was proved in a much bigger generality, right? So um, our original assumption is a sequence of um, simply, connect, or simply connect domains uh, and some extra assumption with that. Um, and one implication of that theorem, one special case of that theorem is a theorem of sequence of wandering domains. Now the, pow the, um, the power I have here so we have an example in the, in the general case of the theorem, we have an example which suggests that the, um, the power one half is needed. However, if the boundary of our, domain is, uh, of, of our domain is smooth, then we don't need the power half. Uh, and just, to, um, just uh, as an analog of what, to link this to what we were saying before about inner functions, uh, in particular, for the case of a sequence of inner functions, um, so the analog of a theorem, the, the analog of part A of this theorem, where instead of the iterates of inner functions, we would have a sequence of uh, different inner functions, uh, holds uh, exactly the same as a, a special case, again, of our more general theorem, where we don't need the power half. Okay, so this is um, this is an analog of um, the first part of the dichotomy theorem for wandering domains, um, and if I have some time at the end, um, I will say a few things about its proof. Um, now. Of course, if we look at the, the, the natural question that followed from that is. What about part B, right? Of course. <laughs> so, okay, let's forget about wandering domains for now. And, and, and remember that we said that our, our general result implies that part A holds also for sequence of inner functions. So can we say that for part B? Is there such a dichotomy or an analog of this dichotomy holding for sequences of inner functions? <laughs> well, actually, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, <laughs> maybe unfortunately, um, it's, uh, it turns out that part B is not always true. And when I say part B is not always true, I mean that uh, with, if, we, if we assume that the sum is divergent, then we cannot always deduce a similar thing, which means that we can have the assumption, actually, we can have, and I'll speak about it in a moment because um, I will mention a few examples. So what we can have is we can have uh, the hypothesis of the divergent sum. And let us go back so that everybody remembers. So we can have the hypothesis of um, a divergent sum and the conclusion that a set of positive measure on the boundary has a, a, a set of positive measure on the boundary um, they is uh, um, has uh, they have orbits converging to um to a specific boundary orbit, right? So let's see. So it's not a, it's not a zero it's not a, um, z, a measure zero set like it was in um, in part B, right? So let's see what exactly. Of course, um, just to say here before I look at the examples that. The, it's not true that it always fails either, because we also have an example where an analog of part B holds for sequence of inner functions. So let's look at these two examples, actually. So first of all, the counter example. When I say the counter example, I mean um, something that um, uh, is not. Uh, um, so we have a divergent, a divergent sum. So here we have a divergent sum. We have a sequence of um, Blaske products. So Blaske products little bn of degree two, we consider the composition capital BN, which is uh, BN of uh, up to B1. 
And we have a divergent sum, okay, as it was in the hypothesis of part B. But actually, we have a set of positive measure which has orbits tending to one on the boundary of the, of the unit uh, disk. Right. So, so in part B, in the case of iterates of inner function, we had a divergent sum. And whenever the Danzois Wolf point was on the boundary, we always had that almost no point on the boundary tends to the Danzois Wolf point under iteration. Here, um, Bn of zero tends to one. And a set of positive measure on the boundary also have orbits tending to one under capital Bn. Um, OK, so although the dichotomy doesn't hold, actually, we have an example which has an analogous behavior to what you would expect from uh, uh, for part, uh, part B for sequence of inner functions. So again, <laughs> sequence of Blaske products of degree two, little bn, and we consider the composition capital Bn. Um, and we have that um, the, orbit, uh, B, uh, the orbit of zero tends to one, and the sum is divergent. Um, and we actually have that the set of points on the boundary of the unit disk whose orbit under Bn tends to one has measure zero. So if you remember, in the case of iterates, whenever the Danzois Wolf point was on the boundary and we had a divergent sum, we had again uh, almost no point on the boundary having an orbit converging to the Danzois Wolf point. So this theorem is an analogy to that, uh, this uh, example is an analogy to that result for sequences of inner functions. Um, okay, so um, this was what I had to say about uh, question uh, two. And let me now move to question three. So what was question three? Question three was, do we always have Danzois Wolf orbits? Um, is there always such a special orbit? So let me first, before I say anything about that, let me first define a Danzois Wolf orbit for an analytic self map of the unit disk. So when we say a Danzois Wolf orbit, we mean it in this way. So if we have um, a sequence of analytic self maps of the unit disk, and we consider the composition of such maps, um, and we suppose that um all points in the interior of the unit disk tend to uh, tend to the unit uh, converge to the unit uh, circle uh, under capital fn then if a boundary point has the property that its orbit after uh, under capital fn uh, tends to the orbit uh, of z under capital fn and um, where again uh, as we said earlier um, with Lasse, um, Fn of zeta is understood as a non tangential limit if it's necessary. Then we call Fn of zeta a Danzois Wolf orbit. So if zeta on the boundary has the property that its orbit Fn of zeta uh, converges to Fn of z, um, where Fn of z is the uh, interior uh, the interior orbit that tends to the unit circle then we say that um fn of zeta is a danzois wolf orbit so we define this um as an analog of the danzois wolf point for the case of sequences of inner functions and the natural question that comes here is do we always have uh, such a danzois wolf orbit and here we have an example <clears throat> Okay, so we have an example, an example um, uh, of a sequence of Mabius maps. So uh, let me, we have a sequence of Mabius maps, little mu n, and we consider the composition capital MN, like we did before. And in, uh, for this um, uh, composition, we have the following. So the orbit of zero tends to one, Actually, let me say here that uh, all these, uh, all the Mebius maps uh, mu n that we consider, uh, 
are such that um, uh, point, uh, points in the interior converge, to, uh, the, the, the orbit of zero, um, if we iterated them, would converge to the boundary. Um, so we have this, uh, the composition of uh, the Mebius maps, uh, capital MN. Uh, so capital MN of zero uh, tends to the boundary of the unit disk, but there is no point on the boundary which has a Danzois Wolf orbit. And this should be understood, I mean, um, it should be understood in, in the sense that, okay, um, we converge to the boundary, but we do not converge to a, a specific boundary orbit, okay? So we get closer and closer to the unit circle, but there is no special orbit on the boundary which we get closer and closer to. Um, okay, and so uh, this shows that um, in, in this case, and for a sequence of um, uh, Mebius maps, uh, it can be that uh, there is no point on the, on the boundary of the unit disk, which has a danzois wolf orbit. Okay, so yes, <laughs> I'm almost out of time. Um, so I think that was all I had to say. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you.